Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Stay Paid. My name is Sefton Eisenhardt, and with me as always is Luke Akery, and today we're going to be talking about something very near and dear to Luke's heart, which is cold calling. Yes, what's up everybody? This is what is my love and my passion. I started out in cold call sales, uh, pounding out the phone, making 150, 200 dials a day, Um, and then my journey went up to being a trainer, and then after training cold callers, was able to be a sales manager, and the rest is history from there. Now I have 80 people on the phones doing everything from cross-selling, upselling to majority of cold calling, and so this is something that I love, and I always think it's interesting because so many businesses run as far away as they can from the idea of cold calling. And even probably some of you listening to this right now, you're probably cringing, thinking, oh, I don't want a cold call. But I am telling you, if there's, if I had a choice, if I was on a desert island, I don't know why I chose a desert, but a desert island, and they said, Luke, you have to grow a business and you can only have one tool with you, what would it be? Absolutely, hands down, 100% of the time, it would be the telephone. Picking up the phone, calling people, that rush of calling people, and that thrill of they don't know anything about you, and within 15 to 20 minutes, you've laid down your value proposition and convinced them to step forward with you for whether that be a product demo or actually handing over credit cards, there's nothing better. So Yeah, and when it comes to a high-dollar item or a high-dollar service, it really does help to have a call center because certain things, especially when you're asking somebody to spend thousands of dollars with you, it just requires a little bit of explanation. It requires a relationship. It requires rapport. It's not like going out and buying a new jacket or a pair of shoes. You need that kind of personal interaction to be able to get the sale from point A to point Z. Correct. And it's not passive. It's proactive. That's why I love cold calling because you're in control. And we'll talk about this probably in one of the points of great cold callers, but it's persistence. Like you can literally make your own destiny by, what is it, dialing for dollars. That's dialing what I would call dollars. it. Dialing Mercenary. for dollars. Yes. Okay, so let's just get right into it because I know that there's so much meat on the bone here that we could probably talk for about four hours. But let, we broke it down into six different parts, kind of going in terms of time, how you should spend your time leading up to designing a cold call and a process and all that stuff. So let's start with part one, which is the script. Yeah, so, you know, when I think of cold calling, there's really, you know, we'll try to walk through six different, I would call them maybe principles or tips, best practices that you should apply. And so you might be an insurance agent listening to this. You might be a real estate agent, financial advisor. It doesn't matter. These principles will apply across all industries. This is really what has made my floor of 80 callers really successful. The first one is what Sefton's talking about, which is your script. You have to first have a script and you have to memorize that script script. And here's the thing that I tell people all the time is that no actor has ever won an Academy Award or an Oscar or whatever you would call it by memorizing and reciting a script. But they first have the script, they memorize it, but then they make it their own and infuse their personality into it and really change it to being something that they believe in. And that's the key is that you want to have a script and you want to have a script really for every situation. So just as the example, if you're a real estate agent, you need a FISBO script, you need an expired listing script, you need a door knocking script, right? You need a script that it lays out not only your introduction, but your value proposition, then how you actually are going to overcome the objections. Then you have to memorize that ingrained in your heart and infuse your personality into that. And what I would say about your script is what you want to focus on is a specialist is always going to sell or outsell a generalist. So what I mean by that is a lot of salespeople will create a script and they will share that same script across all their leads. And what I would recommend to you is that take your script and fine tune it specifically to either the individuals or definitely the industry you're calling because a specialist is always going to outsell a generous and this means you're going to know the language right you're going to know the lingo be able to speak their language and that's going to resonate with them more but even more important than that your script now can be tailored to the exact pain points of that industry so they actually see you and view you as an expert in their industry and they'll value your advice so a couple tips there on your script is you got to memorize it First, you got to have one. You got to memorize it and future personality into it. And when you create your script, take the specialist model every time if you can, which you're customizing your script down to the individual you're calling. Yeah, you need to get it down to a niche. And as far as improvisation and inserting your personality is concerned, that's something that just simply comes with time. People do the script for a week. 
and they think that they can start messing around and ad-libbing and all that stuff. <laughs> and certain people can get away with it after a long period of time memorizing that script, being able to read it in their sleep. But it's just like the fundamentals of any sport. You have to you have to crawl before you can walk. You have to walk before you can. Yeah, you got to trust the process, man. We're a bunch of <laughs> Philadelphia Sixers fans yeah, here. Trust yeah. the process. But no, you're right. It is that the number one, I guess, detriment to a sales caller is they doubt themselves. And so as soon as twofold, one, it doesn't work. You feel it's the script, and so you change the script. Or if it does work, and you said something special, like a one liner in there that was magic, you go, oh my goodness, this is it. And you try to add that one liner to every situation. It doesn't really work that way. So you got to develop a script, stick to that process. That really actually leads to the second point really well, which is your attitude. Um, It's that mindset of, hey, when you face that rejection, don't change your script. But we really summarize it in this smile and dial. I said dial for dollars. I mean that 100%. Top producers versus mediocre producers. Top producers usually outwork mediocre producers every time. I don't care what you say. Give me someone who has a work ethic that has a mindset that is that smile and dial. They're willing to put in the work, and then they have the mindset of the going from rejection to rejection with a smile. It is an absolute no-brainer. I'll choose that person on my team every day over someone who maybe is talented or can shoot the ball well. I want someone who does the fundamentals and puts in the work, does the dials, and understands the mindset of going from call to call with a smile. And what you were referencing some study earlier, I think, before the show, what was that study on smiling? It was just a study that pretty much proves that people can hear you when you're smiling. And it makes a lot of sense. I know, you know, you sang in a band. When I sang in a band, I wasn't hitting a note. The people would tell me, like, smile when you <laughs> sing. Yeah. Because it kind of raises the pitch of your voice. It makes you sound a certain way. And if you come off as unenthusiastic when you're trying to sell in product, it's nearly impossible to think that your prospect is going to be enthusiastic about something that you do not sound enthusiastic about yourself. True. And radio DJs know this, meaning radio DJs know you can feel their smile through the radio. You better believe that your prospect can feel your enthusiasm. They know if you truly are excited, energetic when you call them versus you're moping. A lot of times a a tip that salespeople will use is they'll put a mirror right in front of them and they'll have that mirror right in front of them as they're calling so they can watch themselves because, you know, only I think 7% of communication is actually the words. The rest is coming through like body language, tone, inflection, all those things. And so you got to think about, hey, if you're smiling, that's going to come across. Yeah, even on the phone, which brings us into the third mentality or the third part of this, which is the one call close mentality, which is kind of a term that you kind of coined yourself here at Reminder Media. Yeah, this to me is the secret sauce of what we do here at Reminder Media. So we are closing over 13,000 deals a year. We have high velocity sales here. It's, you know, 150, 200 dials. But really what separates us from our competition, what separates us in cold calling is this idea of the one call close. And now here's the thing. When people hear one call close, they they think slimy, they think pushy and aggressive, and they think that's not true. Nothing's a one call close. That's why I always tell my sales reps and I would tell anybody listening, it's not a reality. You're not going to close everybody ultimately on the first call. You will have some. All of us have one call closes that we love to, you know, uh, celebrate. But the truth is it's a mentality. And this is why it's so critical because most reps, when they get down to the order and they ask for the order and they get that first objection, they believe the first or the second objection that's given to them. And the one call close mentality is all about pushing through the objections to go for the order until you get to the heart of the issue. And I'm telling you right now, guys, the heart of the issue in any sale is always value versus cost. The only reason someone doesn't buy from you is because the value that you have presented does not outweigh the cost in their mind. Now, keep in mind, cost is not just money. It's not just the actual monetary figure. It could be their time that it takes to set up your product, right? So at the end of the day, you have to understand that a one call close mentality is about pushing through that when someone gives you the objection that, hey, I need to talk to my business partner, You're not just going to take that as the grain of salt of, oh, yeah, they're not buying from me today because they want to talk to their business partner. No, you're pushing through that and going, oh, my goodness, totally understand. I actually have a partner in business myself, so I appreciate that. Let me ask you this. 
Is it just talking to your business partner? Meaning like if you didn't have a partner, I guess I would ask you, Sefton, you know, would you step forward with me today? I mean, do you uh, get what I'm presenting to you enough to where you see enough value that you would do this if it was just you? So it's pushing through it's, you know, that acknowledge, isolate, overcome, and maybe we'll talk about that on another uh, podcast, which is how you overcome an objection. But it's really getting down to the root of the issue. And from there, now your chances, even if you don't close that deal on this call, your chance of getting that person to pick up the next time is so much higher or just understanding it's time to move on. This person is not a buyer at all. So many sales reps out there waste so much time following up with people because they did not have a one call close mentality. They did not push through the first, second, third objection to get to the heart of the issue, which is value and cost. Yeah. So which moves us into the fourth part, which is response time, because there is a certain balance that has to be had and knowing when to get to the prospect is half the battle. So if you can get to them quickly, I mean, you obviously increase your likelihood of making a sale. Yeah, we've actually tested this out specifically on our sales floor. So we are paying and Facebook advertising. I mean, we're doing thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And so we're getting hundreds of leads that come in and we've specifically tried to practice what insidesales.com and I think it was like Harvard Review they did a study that said if you reach out to a lead within five minutes you've increased your contact ratio upwards of 400 percent and so there's a couple studies out there that showcase that if you can respond the fastest you have a greater likelihood to be the person that closes I know in real estate specifically I think they choose the first agent that contacts them 72 or 76% of the time. So if you're the first agent that gets them on the phone to follow up to a Zillow lead or to follow up to an open house lead or whatever it is, they choose, the prospect chooses that real estate agent 76% of the time. We've been practicing this in our own lead and have seen this to ring true even on our own sales floor. When we get a Facebook lead that comes in, we try to reach out to that lead within five minutes. We aren't always successful, but we've already seen our contact rates drastically increasing because it makes sense. Someone's on their computer, they click request a sample or they click on that ad to you know request information. And the chances are within five minutes, guess what? They're still going to be at their computer. The thing you have to kind of realize with this is that you have to overcome that awkwardness of, <laughs> I just requested a sample and yeah. now I'm getting a call. It's a little, bit like, and, yeah, it's a little what, creepy. And what we've done, and just a tip for you guys, is that we try to, you know, almost like I hate to say disguise, but we encapsulate it in our customer service. Like yeah. that's how much we care. That's how much we're on top of things. That's how much we care about what you're doing in this business and how much we're going to be there to serve you at every second of every day. And that tends to make people feel more at ease and they can understand what we're doing. And with every passing day, frankly speaking, people are getting a lot more comfortable with that kind of outreach. They understand that if they search something or if they fill out a lead form, there's a reason they're doing it. Correct. Um, and don't, um, I guess, put yourself down just for cold calling here. Because you can reach out to people. We use Twilio, which is a texting application. So now we're starting to text people, and we're getting great response from that too. So cold calling, I know that's what we're talking about on this podcast. But when it think when we talk about this response time, you want to reach out within five minutes, and you want to be the first person that actually contacts that lead because you have a much higher chance to be the one that closes. But you can also use that blitz technique, which is calling, texting, emailing. You know, hit them from a lot of different mediums and angles. Yeah, so that kind of brings us into the fifth part. So you get the response time, you have the one call close mentality, but inevitably, the vast majority of people that you talk to simply are not going to buy on that first call, which brings us to the almighty follow up and the thing that everybody needs to do that seemingly nobody is doing. Yes, yeah, so this is probably the thing that all of us as salespeople are the most guilty of is we have a bunch of leads in our queue and we have not followed up with them. And we know we should, we're thinking about them, and we just don't put in the effort. I think the average rep follows up 1.3 times. But yet, if you call a prospect six to nine times, you've increased your chances of getting that prospect on the phone upwards of 90%. So what I would tell you here is that a good benchmark for yourself would be to call at least nine times. You're the one that referenced the HubSpot study, which was 18 calls. It's going yeah, up it's to 18 calls. Back and forth, back and forth. And different studies are obviously going to cause different statistics to come out. But at the same time, it's always a it, lot more than one point. Correct. <laughs> but notice it didn't go lower. It went yeah. higher. Meaning, so my benchmark, so our, our, our social media calls. So when we get Facebook leads and get um, Instagram leads and all that good stuff, we are calling nine times to get a deal closed. 
And so, you know, just that's our example to you that we're, you know, obviously high velocity sale calling business professionals. We, it takes us nine times. You need to follow up with a prospect nine times. Here's the reason why I think reps don't follow up because the, I explain it in this acronym of CAR, right? And this is the buyer's journey. This is what the prospect, the journey that they're going to go on and why most reps give up. The first phase of the journey of a prospect when you're cold calling them they're going to get that caller ID coming across their cell phone, coming across their work phone, and they're going to be curious. And they're going to say, who is this? I don't know this person, right? And if you use the double dial technique, which is a great tip for all my salespeople out there, you can increase your chances of getting someone on the phone like 18% if you dial them twice within 15 minutes. Just because if you get a phone call that comes across the phone, you're curious, and then you get it again within like five minutes, you're like, okay, who is this? This must be serious, right? But that first phase is that curiosity phase. That prospect's going to wonder who you are. Then after that curiosity phase, they're going to find out who you are because you're going to either leave a voicemail, you're going to talk to them for a few minutes and they didn't buy from you. But then you're going to follow up. And guess what? A lot of times they don't answer and you're hitting a multiple myriad of different ways, email, text, phone, and they're going to get annoyed with you. So they're going to enter into that A phase, which is the annoyance phase, right? And this is where most reps give up. This is why they only follow up 1.3 times because we're raised as human beings to be super nice, right? And be respectful and say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but the reality is- For you're sales, f- it might be a bad thing. I <laughs> but you're going to feel it's awkward to, oh man, I feel like I'm annoying this person. I'm bothering this person, but you're not. Because if you believe in the value that you have and that you're offering with your product, that it outweighs the cost, which is this person's time to take your call, then you can- can keep going. So you have to push through this annoyance phase because it only gets worse. And it goes into the first R, which I say is resentment. They go from a being annoyed with you to almost resenting you to where they don't want to ever talk to you. They don't want to take your call again. And I know some of you salespeople out there are thinking, not if you're a good salesman, they should never resent you. But the truth is That's not that true. people know that you want them to buy. And that's why they don't want to answer your call is they know that you want to sell them on something that you want them to buy from you. And if you keep pushing through that phase, which is what the top producers are able to do, they're able to push through that phase. It moves to the final phase, which is the respect phase. And the respect phase, I've had this happen time and time again, and I bet every salesperson listening to can testify to this, where you have a prospect that signs up for, for with you, then turns to you and goes, Luke, I just have to compliment you so much on your tenacity and your follow-up and your persistence. I just, I wish you worked for me, right? Because you literally push through where most people give up and where you would have, if you would have left at the annoyance or the resentment phase, then you would have been annoying and you would, and I would have resented you because you literally just wasted my time. But because you pushed through, because you believed enough and kept going to that nine calls or what HubSpot would say, 18 calls, right? Because you push through, that's why they respect you because they took what was they thinking, what they were thinking is just a sales process and a salesman. And then it turned into somebody they thought, man, this person must be very passionate about what they're selling to me because they will not let me go. They must truly believe in it. So there's the car process for you and why most people don't follow up, but you need to. And there's number six, which is something that can help you with your follow-up, uh, which is the holistic approach. Never in the history of sales have there been so many options for a salesperson to connect with somebody, and it doesn't always have to be exclusively phone calls. And this is something we could do an entire other episode. Yeah, on, we might. We might do another approach. yeah podcast on this. But yes, I think as we move into this new age of marketing with social, that Every sales professional out there needs to understand that cold calling needs to transcend just the phone and go into text messaging and into cold social media outreach through LinkedIn. So yeah, holistic marketing is a huge thing on my radar today. And I think that, you know, transcends and translates right over into phone calls, which is holistic approach to your cold calling. Yeah. Provide them value and try to get at them everywhere that you possibly can. There you guys have it, the six elements of a good cold calling program. The first is your script. The second is going to be your attitude. The third is going to be a one-call close mentality. The fourth will be your response time. Number five is good follow-up, and number six is a holistic approach. Make sure if you like this content to give us a five-star review and a positive comment. My name is Sefton Eisenhart. And I'm Luke Akery, and I'll close with this. Take action on one of these six principles that you've heard today. Difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer is top producers take action. 